A reminder from Peter. A reminder from Peter. Now, in Luke 22, 31 through 32, it says in Scripture here, And the Lord said, Simon, Simon, meaning Peter, Indeed, Peter, Satan has asked for you, that he may sift you as wheat. But I have prayed for you, says Jesus, that your faith should not fail. And when you have returned to me, strengthen your brethren. There is so much that is said in verse 1 and 2. In verse 31, it reveals a spiritual battle going on that our eyes do not see, but it is real. Satan is always on the attack. Satan and all of his minions, fallen angels, demonic spirits, work for him night and day to attack, to attack the believers of God. They do not attack unbelievers because they already own them. It is, the book of Revelation records that Satan has declared war on those who hold to the testimony of Jesus Christ to the church. And so when we see in verse 31 here of Luke chapter 22, Satan is desiring to sift you as wheat, to, to be in your life, to have control of you, to devour you, to eat you, to destroy you. And he has to get permission from Jesus. Now I want you to understand something here. Every trial and tribulation that you go through, it's known as adversity. And sometimes it's God ordained for us to go through those things, meaning, and also sometimes it's meant for, we go through those things because of our own, listen here, because of our own foolishness. But regardless of whether it's our own foolish decisions that we make, or if it's just a God ordained moment, trials and tribulations will come our way as Christians to test us or tempt us. I talk about this all the time. Why? Because this is what you face, church, every day. You face sin every day. And that is why we must talk about how to understand the spiritual battles in the heavenly realms that we cannot see with our physical eyes, but we know by faith, according to the written word of God, that they exist and that they are there. Satan wants to destroy you, and he needs Jesus' permission to even begin an attack. And yes, guess what? You want to hear something? A lot of, all the time, Jesus will tell Satan, yes, you can try. Go ahead, but don't take their life. Don't do this, don't do that. You're bound. God will always give boundaries to what Satan can do in your life. Because God will never give you something that you cannot get out of. And I speak to the Christian here. I speak to the Christian. If you're an unbeliever, you belong to Satan. God doesn't need permission. I mean, Satan doesn't need permission from God. He already owns you. And that is why we see such horrific things out there. I just saw, read a story early this morning, late last night, about the midnight hour. I, I came across a news article. It said that um, in Utah, this a uh, couple, couple weeks ago, I believe, a week ago, a mother committed murder-suicide, killed her three little children and herself. And the family has no idea why. There was no signs of anything. They just found them all dead in the car. And her too. What would drive a woman to do such things? And the family is in total shock. This was a woman that was a professional. She seemed to have it all. And so we think we seem to have it all together. We think that we seem to have things lined up. But we have no idea what's happening underneath, what's happening deep on the inside, the struggles that people go through. This is real. You know, one of them was a two-year-old child, a four, a two, and a one-year-old. And it, and it hits me so hard because I look at my grandson, David, and I'm like, how could we, how could, much less any age, how could we do something like this? What, what happened to this poor woman where, where, she, where, where, where her mind was just captivated and taken? by the power of darkness. Peter had no idea that Satan was about to infiltrate his life. Jesus knew. But look at verse 32. But I have prayed for you that your faith should not fail. 
and that when you return to me, strengthen your brethren. Jesus is saying you're going you're gonna to fall temporarily, but get up, you're going to return to me, and look. And that is what I speak to the Christian about, strengthen your brethren. From the, your failures, Peter, listen, from your failures, use that experience to strengthen the church. Are you doing that? Because you and I both have failures in Christ. We've experienced pain in Christ. But are we using that to strengthen our local church? Or are we just sitting at home, woe to me, feeling sorry for ourselves? I want you to take courage this morning that even if you fail, get up, return to Jesus, and with those experiences, strengthen the church. This is why praying together as a church is so important. A lot of Christians, and hear me out, this morning I'm going to talk about the judgment seat of Christ and the great white throne judgment. And I'm going to tell you that at the judgment, and they are not the two same judgments, they are two totally separate judgments. And at the judgment seat of Christ, which is reserved for Christians alone, there will be a great number of Christians that will be ashamed and crying. Jesus says, well done, my good and faithful servant. Jesus says, enter into my rest. Jesus says, many are called, but only a few have been chosen. Jesus will say to the right, enter. Jesus will say to the left, depart. We have to understand that the Lord not only looks at all we do but he looks at what we do in regards to his church we have to understand that if we're giving more to the 7-eleven than we are to the church of our local church in regards to our treasure or anything I've said this over and over that says a lot about our character that says a lot about our obedience to the will of God that says a lot about what we're all about you know, we have to be a people that understand that if, we, if, God, if God is God, then we trust God. If God is the Lord, if the Lord is mighty, if the Lord is holy, do you know what? We have to prove it. We have to prove it. Here we go. Peter had to prove it. He denied Christ three times, but he came back. And in John chapter 21, Jesus asked him three times, do you love me? Do you love me? Do you love me? Why would Jesus ask such a question? Jesus was asking because he knew the answer, yes. But he was redeeming Peter. He was reminding Peter, you denied me three times, but I'm telling you, I want you to confess now that you love me. Confess, Peter. And freely, Peter confessed. By your tongue, you'll be saved. By your tongue, you'll be condemned. Peter condemned the Lord, but then Peter turned around and confessed the Lord. Now, it's one thing to say it, but out of the abundance of our heart, our mouth will speak. Peter had a broken heart, a broken spirit, and God came to heal him, to re-heal him. Because a lot of times we lose our way, Christians. Peter walked with him for three and a half years, and then Peter lost his way. Can anyone say, hey, man, I've been there as a Christian? Amen. You've lost your way before? Amen? Amen. In 2 Peter 1, 5 through 15, by this time, Peter is an old man. He's an old man. He's about ready to give up his life. He's about ready to fulfill what Jesus said he would do at the end of his life. And Peter could have said a lot of stuff, and he did. In First and Second Peter, he spoke about the end time church. He spoke about the character. He spoke about suffering. Why? Because he was a man who could identify with all of that because he went through it. He took his experiences of life and he used it to benefit the church. But what I, I, out of 1st and 2nd Peter, what grabs me the most, because Peter was such a, a, a hard man. You know, uh, uh, was a, uh, when he first started walking with Jesus, he was most figurative, figuratively to be known as a macho man. A tough guy. Rough around the edges. You know, I mean, to, to be a leader amongst a group of 12 men, you had to be pretty tough, especially these type of guys. 
He kept putting his foot in his mouth. And Jesus kept having to take it out of his mouth. And so we learn by this time, in Peter's old age, he says something so profound. And what I take is that he says this because he experienced it. He was not known to be a man of love, a man of peace, a man of patience, a man of gentleness. That was not Peter, guys. You know that. His, his, his name is translated Peter as the rock. He was a hard man. But look what he says in 2 Peter 1, 5 through 15. He says, But also for this very reason, giving all diligence, add to your faith virtue, and to virtue knowledge. What is he talking about here? I want to break it down. I don't want to go through this whole chapter. But I want to go quickly because I've got other things to read to you that tie into this. But Peter is talking about the very character that the Holy Spirit of God will develop in the life of a Christian. Peter is saying, for this reason, why we have been saved, why we have been delivered, why we claim to be Christians. Look, he says with diligence. And what does that word diligence mean? It means to be careful and persistent in your work or in your effort. Are you careful and are you persistent in your walk with Jesus? Or do you watch too much TV? Do you play too many video games? Are you too busy doing things other than maintaining your relationship with Christ? If Christ is first, everything else will fall in order. Now, that's what diligence means. Look here at verse 5. With all diligence, add to your faith, look, your faith, what? Your faith, that, that's your walk with Jesus, your relationship. You worship by things you cannot see or hear, but you know, you believe. That's your faith. My people shall live by faith. That's what Jesus says. So add unto faith, look, virtue. Virtue. What is virtue? It's your behavior showing high moral standards, meaning excellence. Is there spiritual excellence in your life today? So how do you add to your faith? By knowing what the scriptures say and obeying them. Doing what is right when no one else is watching. You'll do what's right when people are watching. Amen? In the church, you'll praise God and sing the songs and do all that. But what about when no one's watching? Will you still do right? Will you still praise God? Will you honor God with what your eyes are looking at and what your, or anything else or what your ears are hearing? That's what virtue is. Excellence. Spiritual excellence. You give your very best. That's what virtue is. And to virtue knowledge you give knowledge add to your faith virtue add to your faith your relationship with Christ look knowledge what is knowledge exactly what it means knowing the scriptures knowing what the scriptures say about Jesus Christ not just depending on what the preacher says on Sunday it's important and I tell the people that if you miss a Sunday service watch during the week what I said during the week Sadly, a lot, of, a, lot of, a lot of people here at this church don't. They don't. They miss a service. They just miss it. And they don't ever hear what's being said in this pulpit. They'll go four or five weeks without ever hearing what was being said in this pulpit. Yet they call this their church. Yes, they call Jesus their Lord and Savior. When the most important thing that we do as Christians is the proclamation of the gospel of Jesus Christ. How do you know that I could be a false teacher and come up here and start saying things and you just, you don't know what the written word of God is and because you don't know the word of God, you start believing what I'm saying. You need to know the written word of God. Knowledge, my people perish for lack of knowledge. That's what the scripture says. So you add to your faith, you add virtue, you add knowledge. And look, to knowledge... You had self-control. Let, let me back up real quickly to knowledge. What, what did God tell Adam and Eve? You could eat of all the trees, but except for this tree here, which is, what is, what is that tree called? The tree of knowledge of good and evil. You see, man tries to attain knowledge on their own effort. When God in the Garden of Eden was really saying, I'll give you knowledge. You don't need to eat the tree of knowledge. I'll give it to you. But you see, man was duped into believing in order to get knowledge, you got to do this, disobey God, eat from that tree. You get what I'm saying? And so how do we get knowledge today? 
We have to connect, disconnect ourselves from the things that the world says. Listen, please, because a lot of you, us, have bought in this. Knowledge comes from God. The book of James says there's only two types of knowledge. R study the scriptures for yourself. The book of James says there's only two types of knowledge. Knowledge that is from above, which is heavenly, and it's of God. And the other knowledge is earthly. And the Bible says in James that, and that knowledge is demonic in its root. It's demonic. So if you're learning the things of this world and thinking that you can apply them to your Christian life, you're sadly mistaken. That results in being a lukewarm Christian. So in order to add to your faith, you need to have the knowledge of God. Ask God for wisdom. You know, when you're asking God for wisdom, He's giving you knowledge because knowledge gives birth to wisdom. You hear what I said? Knowledge gives birth to wisdom. You know it's good to read the Bible, but when you begin to open the Bible and read it, ah, now you're going into wisdom. And to that, self-control. Self-control. And what does that mean? The ability to control oneself regardless of your emotions or the desires of your heart. You have self-control because you know what the will of God says and you hold the will of God above all other things, even your own feelings and emotions. A lot of people don't come to church because they're church hurt. Pastor Jason talked about this the other day. They don't come to church because they're church hurt. They don't take part in church things because they're church hurt. And that is what we see happening. In, I talked about it uh, last week. Uh, Pastor Raul Cortez he knows a lot of churches in his church. He said, man, it's cold, cold. A lot of people are cold. He says a lot of churches are experiencing this. People falling away from the faith, falling away from church fellowship, falling away from walking with truly walking in obedience to the will of God. You can be a Christian and still walk in disobedience to God. I mean, look, look, at, look at Jonah, right? Look at Peter. Peter became a hypocrite. He was a Christian, but he was walking in disobedience. And there's going to come a point in time where God has to draw them back and say, hey, come on, let's go. Let's get this right. But what happens if they never get it right and the rapture happens? Or the end of their life comes and they die in disobedience? Well, I believe the scripture is going to teach us that what it happens here in just a moment. We have to be a people of self-control. Isn't the self-control a fruit of the Holy Spirit? Yes, it is. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. And here you go, adding to your faith self-control, now you add what? Perseverance. Look what the scripture says. To self-control, perseverance. What does perseverance mean? To continue in doing what you know is right, or sadly wrong. You could have perseverance in doing good or doing bad. But it, the biblical meaning of perseverance is to continue to do something which is right, regardless of difficulties, failure or opposition regardless you're going to persevere you're going to do what is right why because god has told you what is right and in his strength you can do these things look to perseverance godliness godliness means to conform to the character of god in your thoughts your feelings and your desires are you godly this morning are you godly is your character like God? Is your character like Jesus? Are you truly walking in the ways of the Lord? You see, because this is, again, here is Peter, a man who, his failures were before the whole world. <laughs> and yet at the end of his life, the last book of his life, he's talking about this stuff because he's experienced it. He knows what it's like to fall flat on your face before the whole church and be a failure. But he's using this for your benefit. And we have to learn to do, pass the baton on. I, I've had failures. I've had victories. Probably had more failures than victories in my walk. But I'm still up here at this pulpit. God has not removed me. God has still put his breath in me and his hand upon me. It's all for his glory alone. And as long as he allows me to do that, we must persevere. We must practice self-control. We must have virtue. We must uh, apply the knowledge that God gives to us. 
regardless of anybody supports you, regardless of anybody comes up and encourages you, you still have the encouragement of the Lord. You still have the hand of God. For Grace Christian Center, when we all get to heaven, God will reveal to us that there was so much more work we could have done, but we didn't do it because of this and this and this and this. Yes, you're saved. Yes, you made it to heaven. But we could have laid so much more glory at the feet of Jesus. But because we did not add to our faith virtue, knowledge, self-control, perseverance, godliness. Another one. Here you go. Verse 7. Brotherly kindness. I see that everywhere I go. We're just not kind anymore. I saw a Christian movie last night where this young man, when he was not a Christian, had no manners whatsoever. No kindness, just mean. Just mean. After he became a Christian, he went and made things right with people. He even went to visit um, a store, a coffee house, where a year before, when he was not a Christian, he had tried to hit on the girl at the counter, working the counter, and her father, who owned the place, came out and said, hey, get out of here. And he pretty much basically, not in a Christian film, using curse words, but he basically cursed the father out and left. A year later, he's walking down the street, he's a Christian man, and he looks and he sees the coffee house and he remembers what happened a year ago. He goes back into that coffee house and he apologizes to the young lady and he apologizes to the father. That's brotherly kindness. You hear what I'm saying this morning? Amen. Uh, you hear what I'm saying this morning? Amen. We're lacking that. You know, thinking of others be, be, uh, ab above ourselves. The world is geared to, you must do for yourself, you must look out for yourself, and you must think only about yourself. And Jesus says, love your enemies. Love those who persecute you. It, I, we, we claim to love each other, and yet so many Christians cannot even support each other. They cannot even support their local churches. There's more takers than givers. There's takers. They take, they take, they take. They don't give. And again, I, I love my brothers and sisters. I, I'm, I, there's no way that I could do what I do if I'm not in the love of God. I'm in the love of God. But I see what I see. And I know what I know. And I've got a commission to say what I have to say. And, and, there's, and again, all will be revealed at the judgment seat of Christ. And that is where we're getting at right now. But Paul, I mean, uh, Peter says, look, verse 7, and godliness to brotherly kindness. Look at that. You being, the quality of being friendly, generous, and considerate to all. To all people. And kindness, brotherly kindness, look, to love. Faith, hope, and love, but the greatest of these is love. And that's translated, I believe, into the agape love. Love the way God loves. You don't condone sinful actions. You don't condone the things that sinful people do in this world, but you have an agape love. You're known by your love. I want to be known. We need to be known for the love of God in our hearts. And it has to be seen. When you come walking down the street, are people going to be glad that they see you or be like, hey, let's go, let's go hide? Sometimes you talk to people, you come up, and all they're talking about is themselves, themselves, themselves. That's all they're talking about. There's just, or, or you come up to a person, there's no friendliness, there's no, there's no thankful, I'm so glad to see you, how you been doing? There's none of that. There's no, there's no when we're departing, there's no, God bless you, see you later, because there may not be a later. And you wish you could have said, goodbye, take care, I'll see you soon. There's no friendliness. There's none of these things in our life as a Christian. These are the basics that Peter talked about. Why? Because Peter was probably a mean, rude man. 
Verse 8. Peter says, For if these things are yours, if, 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 if this is what is in your life are yours, and you abound, look, you grow in these things, you will be neither barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. Are you fruitful in the knowledge of Jesus Christ? Look at that scripture there, please. Are you fruitful in the knowledge of Jesus Christ? Because if you're fruitful in the knowledge, guess what? It's going to give birth to wisdom. Wisdom is action. You're doing the things of God. You're being His hands. You're being His feet. There are so many Christians that are barren. They have no fruit to show. They'll make it into heaven, but they have nothing to show how much Jesus meant to them when they lived on the earth. I don't understand that. I would have been like, get out of here then. You don't belong in here. But that's not the heart of God. God still loves you. You repented of your sins. You confessed your sin. You asked Him to be your Lord and Savior. But yet, you had hardly any fruit to show. I don't understand that. That's a part where, that's a place where I can't go because I'm not God. But God only, know, God only knows that. The thief on the cross, listen, he went to heaven with no fruit. No fruit. And the Lord took him. You will be with me in paradise today. You hear what I'm saying? There will be Christians in heaven that had hardly any fruit to show. And that's why the Bible says God will wipe away every tear. Because you're going to be heartbroken and wish you could have done more for the Lord because you realized He was worth it. More than worth it. What He did on the cross. And so all things you do, you're not doing to the pastor, to this church. You're doing it unto the Lord. All that you did, you did unto the Lord. People take church fellowship for granted. One day, it's not going to be here. One day, we're not going to be allowed to visit. They take it for granted. You know, and I hear what the Holy Spirit is saying to the churches in America. He's saying, okay, you quenched me. You kicked me out of the school. You kicked me out of your churches. You're on your own. We take these things for granted. Now, I know not you, you're here, right? But is there more that we could give to the Lord? Because didn't Peter say, if you abound? What does that word abound mean? It means if you grow. Don't ever think that you can give enough, you've given enough to God. You're called to give more and more and more. Look, verse 9. For he who lacks these things is short-sighted even to blindness, and has forgotten that he was cleansed from his old sins. Therefore, brethren, be even more diligent to make your call and election sure. For if you do these things, you will never stumble. For so in an entrance will be supplied to you abundantly into the everlasting kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. For this reason, I will not be negligent to remind you always of these things, though you know and are established in the present truth. You know these things, but Peter says, but I'm going to keep reminding you. How? By when preachers read this passage, Peter's reminding them again. Peter, the reminder, is, is reminding you today. Verse uh, four, 13. Yes, he says, I think it is right, as long as I am in this tent, this body, to stir you up by reminding you, knowing that shortly I must put off my tent just as our Lord Jesus Christ showed me, meaning he's about to die. He says, and moreover, I will be careful to ensure that you always have a reminder of these things after my decease. Here's a man who's about to die. Tradition teaches that he died on the cross and asked to be nailed to the cross upside down. Head down, feet up. Why? Because he didn't find it worthy, him worthy to die the way Jesus died on the cross. Jesus told him, you're going to have a horrible death. And Peter still chose to follow Jesus. Jesus never promised you an easy life. He promised you eternal life. So embrace what is on your plate and rejoice in the Lord. Isn't that what the book of James says? 1 Peter 4, 17. Peter says this. For the time has come for judgment to begin at the house of God. And if it begins with us, 
First, what will be the end of those who do not obey the gospel of God? See, Peter is bringing a revelation here. He's saying there's going to come a judgment. He's speaking here of the judgment seat of Christ. He's speaking here of the judgment seat of Christ. Again, for the time has come for judgment to begin at the house of God. And if it begins with us first, meaning if it begins with us first, there's going to be a second. You see that, right? What will be the end of those who do not obey the gospel of God? There's a judgment for them too. Look at 2 Peter 3, 7. Peter says this, But the heavens and the earth, which are now preserved by the same word, are reserved for fire until the day of judgment of perdition of ungodly men. Peter is saying that there is one judgment about the righteous and there is another judgment about ungodly people. And this is what we call to come, become known as the judgment seat of Christ for the Christian and the great white throne judgment for the unbeliever. And this will happen in eternity when all is said and done now Revelation 20 12 again says this and I saw the dead small and great standing before God and books were opened and another book was opened which is the book of life and the dead were judged according to their works by the things which were written in the books you see there are books that record your thoughts there are books that will record your words. There are books that will record your actions. There are books in heaven that record everything. You know, God is big about writing things down. Do you know that? <laughs> the Bible, the Law of Moses, the Lamb's Book of Life. There will be a book in heaven that if your name is not in that book, which is called the Lamb's Book of Life, you will not have eternal presence of God. You will not reside in heaven with him forever. Your name must be written, listen, in the Lamb's book of life. Is your name written this morning in the Lamb's book of life? Is it? You better say amen if you believe it. If not, why are you not being bold? Hey, I'm, I'm, I'm in the Lamb's book of life. My name is written by the blood of Jesus. Amen. He paid the price for my sins. And I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. I am a Christian. I'm a follower of Jesus. I'm a disciple. I'm not perfect, but I'm nowhere near what I used to be. I am no sinner. I am a saint. You are saints, Christian. And it's time we start living like saints. We start breaking out of this earthly tent. That we start allowing the Lord, the Holy Spirit, to develop the God character in us. We'll never be God, okay? But He's called us to follow him and to be like him. And this is what Peter, he comes to the end of his life and he says, these are the things you must have in your life, Christian. And if you abound in them, guess what? You will enter into heaven with glory. With glory. And isn't that our eternal prize, treasure? Isn't that what we're seeking after? But before all that, there will be judgments. Hebrews 10 26 through 39. This is a reminder from Peter. This whole message, it ties together. Look, the writer says in Hebrews, he speaks about the Christian. For if we sin willfully after we receive the knowledge of the truth, there no longer remains a sacrifice for sins. Wow. Once saved, always saved. Boom. Gone. That theology that in so many churches embrace is gone. If we sin willfully after we receive the knowledge of the truth, that's talking about receiving, you received something from God. The truth, Jesus is the way, the truth and the life. There no longer remains a sacrifice for your sin. You're not covered by the blood. We can walk, we cannot lose our salvation. We give it up. We walk away from it. Just like Judas walked away. Just like Peter temporarily walked away. But he came back. Jesus said, I'm praying that when you return. Isn't that what Pe Jesus said? What we just read? When you return. There are many out of the church today that need to return. That's why we're called to come pray in the church on Wednesday nights. There are people in our families that need to return to the Lord. And you know what? I'm going to tell you the truth. Many of them won't 
because you didn't find it important enough to gather for the prayer. Were you really praying? Look, here's what the Lord had told me a long time ago. If, they're not, if they don't count it important to pray together as a church, they're not praying at home. Ooh. I'm sorry, but, but wasn't I called to preach the truth? It's true because I've experienced this. When in, my, in, in 17 years as a pastor, when I didn't want to go to prayer meetings, when I didn't want to do these, it's because I wasn't praying. I wasn't praying. I wasn't doing the things God called me to do. I wasn't walking in fellowship with Him. So I'm speaking from experience. I've been there. Or you come to the church and you're there in a prayer meeting, you're mostly on your phone. You're on your phone. You know who told me about that? Pastor Eric Ayaso. He's with the Lord now. But he knows what it's like to fail God. He served eight years in prison. I knew this boy before he went to jail. He was a worship leader. Most amazing worship leader I've ever known. English, Spanish. Man, he could do it. His father still pastors the church here in Alvin. Spanish church. And I told young Eric Ayaso, he's about, he was about you know, 12 years younger than me. And I told him when he was 20 years old when I met him, I said, always honor God with your, with your anointing. And he says, yes, brother, thank you, thank you, thank you. And he didn't. He ended up going to jail. He ended up going to jail for eight years for a crime he committed. When he got out of jail, the first day he got out of jail, out of prison, I, I went and visited with him at his home the second day out of prison. He, 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 he was so far behind on technology and all this and all that, but he was so far advanced in the Word of God. He didn't miss a beat in prison. He led worship, Bible studies, and one thing he told me, he said, we were sitting in, in my car, and you know, I, that time I had a, a white GT Mustang, and he's like, man, just two days, two days ago I was in prison. And now here I am in a fine, nice sports car going a little fast down Highway 35, <laughs> the Angleton, the, the Vietnamese parole officer. And he says, my dad gave me this phone. He goes, my dad gave me this phone. He's sitting there. And I know he would love for me to share this with you. He goes, my, I was sitting. He goes, my dad gave me this phone as I got out of prison. He goes, but when I looked at this phone, I was like, he goes, how do you say it? He goes, I remember when I would play worship in the church before prison, before I went to prison, after, when, when I was in the pews and my dad was preaching and guest preachers were coming, they were preaching fire. He goes, man, I was always in the pew doing this. Always doing this. He told me this. He goes, and now, I went eight years without a phone. He goes, and now, he goes, I don't need that. And you know, he died several months ago. He got sick. We don't know what it was, but he got sick. Some kind of anti uh, uh, virus, something just overwhelmed his body. But you know, he never got on social media or none of that stuff. He was out of prison for a little over two and a half years, I believe. Three years, maybe. But he never got on social media because he, cause I would ask him. He goes, nah, he goes, I don't need all that. He was, he was so consumed. He was preaching. Something I never thought I'd see Eric do. He was preaching. He was preaching. So I'd watch him on Sunday nights. He preached Spanish and English at the same time, back and forth. I'm like, man, the guy, he came back to the Lord. He returned. I just talked to his mom and daddy yesterday. You know, they're planning for a, a, an outdoor service here, which I will attend. And, and you know, it's, they still are serving the Lord. He was their oldest son. They're heartbroken. They're, they're torn to pieces that their oldest son is gone. When it, he's in heaven, but he's gone. But they're still serving in the church. They're still serving the Lord and meeting together. That's hard. Especially when you depended on him when he was gone for eight years. Then he came back for that brief time and now he's gone. You don't know how much time you have left. His funeral was so beautiful. The time that he had left, that he didn't know he had left, he honored God. He was very effective. 
But when we walk away, or we willfully sin, willfully, what does that really say about who we are? There is forgiveness for the sin in the life of a Christian, but there is no forgiveness for a habitual lifestyle of sin, meaning when you willfully, when you continue. There's judgment for that. Let's read on. Hebrews 10, 27. He says here, oh, let, let me start again, verse 26. For if we sin willfully, after we receive the knowledge of the truth, it says here, there no longer remains a sacrifice for sins. Amen? You hear that? But a certain fearful expectation of judgment and fiery indignation which will devour the adversaries. Anyone who has rejected Moses' law dies without mercy on the testimony of two or three witnesses. Of how much worse punishment do you suppose will he be thought worthy who has trampled the Son of God underfoot and counted the blood of the covenant by which he was sanctified, a common thing, and insulted the Spirit of grace? For we know him, God, who said, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. And again, the Lord will judge his people. And it is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. But recall the former days in which, after you were illuminated, you endured a great struggle with sufferings, partly while you were made a spectacle, both by reproaches and tribulations, and partly while you became companions of those who were so treated. For you had compassion on me in my chains. And joyfully, says the writer, I accepted the plundering of your goods, knowing that you have a better and an enduring possession for yourselves in heaven. So therefore, do not cast away your confidence, which has great reward. For you have need of endurance, so that after you have done the will of God, you may receive the promise. For yet a little while, and he who is coming will come and will not tarry. Now the just shall live by faith, but if anyone draws back, my soul has no pleasure in him. But we are not of those who draw back, look, to perdition, to evil, but of those who believe to the saving of the soul. Everything I've said sums it up there. Now here, 1 Corinthians 3, 5 through 15. This is known as the judgment seat of Christ. Who then is Paul, and who is Apollos? But ministers through whom you believed, as the Lord gave to each other. Paul says here, I planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the increase. He's talking about ministers and how they're not in competition with each other. We all have a work of God that we do. Okay, verse 7. So then, neither he who plants is anything, nor he who waters, but it's God who gives the increase. God makes things grow. Amen? Verse 8. Now he who plants and he who waters, they're really one. And each one will receive his own reward according to his own labor. For we are God's fellow workers. You are God's field. You are God's building. But according to the grace of God, which was given to me, says Paul, as a wise master builder, I have laid the foundation and another and another and another and another Christian, they build on it. But let each one take heed of how you build on this foundation. We are all building on the foundation of Jesus. Take heed of this. For no, look here, for no other foundation, verse 11, can anyone lay than that which is already laid, which is Jesus Christ. For if anyone builds on this foundation with gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, and straw, each one's work will become clear for the day, the, the judgment seat of Christ, the day, capital D, the day, it's not an ordinary day, it will declare it, because it will be revealed by fire, and the fire will test each one's work of what sort it is. If anyone's work which has, he has built on it endures, he will receive a reward. But if anyone's work is burned, he will suffer loss, but he himself will be saved, yet so as through fire. This is explained clearly that as a Christian, the things we've done in the body of Christ will be put on the altar of God at the judgment seat of Christ. When does this event happen? I believe this happens. I, I'll be honest with you, the Bible doesn't really tell us exactly when this happens. My opinion, I think this happens after, it may happen in parts, it may happen, I don't know. But when all believers are gathered together before the throne of God, everyone will lay our work at the feet of Jesus. And that Holy Spirit fire will hit it. It will reveal 
what was done with right intention and what was done with wrong intention. And whatever was done with a wrong heart will be burned up. Whatever was done with a right heart in the name of Jesus will be there. And that's why you're going to lay gold, silver, wood, hay, stubble. You're, you're going to do all kinds of things, meaning you're going to have failures and you're going to have victories. Things you did in the body of Christ as a Christian, you're going to lay all your failures and your victories at the foot of Jesus. And whatever was right, was pure, will endure through the fire of God. And then you could pick that up and you could say, God, Jesus, Lord, this is how much you meant to me. And that will be your treasure. That will speak for all of eternity how much you love Jesus. Don't you want to lay great treasures of Jesus? How much he truly meant to you? That's why the Bible says be a cheerful giver. Because a cheerful giver gives everything. We don't count about, well, I, I need a little for this, a little bit. If God says give it, give it. Give it. And that's what we saw in the book of First Act, in the book of Acts. They were giving freely everything. Their time, their talent, everything. Why? Because they understood, listen, what it meant to really, really have these characters of God in them. They were so fresh. The church was on fire. So much of the church is cold today. 2 Corinthians 5, 9 through 10. Here's another scripture about the, the judgment seat of Christ. It says, Therefore, we make it our aim, says Paul, whether present or absent, to be well-pleasing to God, to Jesus. Look at that. Look, as Christians, look, verse 10, For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that each one may receive the things done in the body according to what he has done, whether good or bad. There you go. Everything I've said to you, there it is. We're going to be judged as believers at the judgment seat of Christ, whether good or bad, things we did. And it's going to, I'm telling you, some are going to be in heaven for eternity with great treasure, and some not with great treasure. But you'll be there. Back up to verse 15, 1 Corinthians 3.15, please. If anyone's work is burned, he will suffer loss, but he himself will be saved Yet as so through fire. If your work is burned up, meaning you had a lot of works you did that were not right as a Christian, it's going to be burned up, but you're not going to go to the flame of hell. You're saved. You'll be saved. You'll suffer loss. You'll suffer loss in heaven, but you'll be saved. Yet so as through fire. You're going to be judged. And that's the judgment you want to be at. That's the judgment you need to be at. But Revelation 20, 11 through 15 speaks of a different judgment. Let me quickly read this. This is at the end of time. This is at the end of the millennial reign of Christ. This is when everything is said and done. Everything is said and done. Satan, the false prophet, the Antichrist, they've all already been cast into the lake of fire. Everything. This is at the end of time, where time will one day cease to exist, and then there will be only eternity, which has always been. See, look, there are two realms. Look at this. There's eternity, and then there's time. Time began at some point. I believe that happened when sin came into the world. But one day, time will cease to exist. But eternity always has been. And this is at the end of time, when there will be no more sin done away with once and for all. John says, I saw a great white throne and him, capital H, him, that's God, who sat on it, from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away and there was no, found no place for them. Why is the throne white? You see, when John, the apostle John, who wrote the book of Revelation by the hand of the Lord, listen, when he saw the throne of God in Revelation chapter 4, he saw a brilliance of colors. So many incredible colors. Why? Because that's what the believer sees, the glory of God. But at this time, when John sees this great white throne judgment, it's only one color. Not a brilliance of colors like Revelation 4. Only one. Why? Because white symbolizes holiness. And who is standing at this great white throne judgment? Let's read it. And I saw the dead, small, great, I saw the dead, 
small and great, standing before God. And the books were opened. Another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged according to their works by the things which were written in the books. We want to be judged by the work of Jesus. We don't want to be judged by our works in regards to our salvation. We want to be judged by the work of Jesus in regard to our salvation. Why is the throne white? Because these people on the earth that are at this judgment, they never believed that God was holy. They never believed He was holy. They never believed that He was the righteous Holy One. And so they will stand before the great white throne, unable to speak, unable to appeal their case. They will be without excuse. They will have nothing to say, but only to stand to be sentenced to judgment. Because they believed not in the Holy One. Verse 13, The sea gave up the dead who were in it. Death and Hades delivered up the dead who were in them. And they were judged. Do you hear that? Not only the sea, but even death and hell gave up the dead. And they were judged, each one according to his works. Then death and Hades were cast into the lake of fire. And this is the second death. And anyone not found written in the book of life, the book of Jesus, hallelujah, was cast into the lake of fire. You see, hell is not the eternal place. The lake of fire is the eternal place. The Bible says here that even hell itself will be thrown into the lake of fire. The lake of fire is the final place of damnation. This is a reminder from Peter how to avoid the judgment, great white throne judgment and how to be accepted at the judgment seat of Christ. When you allow the Holy Spirit to work in you, to develop in you, guess what guys? You're going to be rejected by this world, but you'll be accepted by the kingdom of God. You'll be hated by men, but you'll be accepted by Christ. We have to look at ourselves. Look, I want to tell you this. Are you a fountain or are you a drain? Are you a fountain or are you a drain? Are you a giver or are you a taker? It will all be exposed at the judgment seat of Christ. It will all be exposed at the great white throne judgment. Peter learned, it's not by might or strength, but by the Spirit of the Lord developing the character of God within him. Peter had to freely surrender his self-will to learn the things of God. Peter had to learn this. In my last scripture, it says so right here. Peter learned what it means to surrender his self-will to find the things of God. In John 21, 18-19. Jesus tells Peter, Most assuredly, I say to you, Peter, when you were younger, you girded yourself and you walked where you wished, meaning you clothed yourself. You went anywhere you wanted to go. He says, But when you are old, you will stretch out your hands, and another will clothe you, and they will carry you where you do not wish to go. This he spoke, signifying by what death Peter would glorify God. And when he had spoken this to Peter, he said to him, follow me. He said, Peter, when you're an old man, they're going to crucify you. The way you saw me die is the way you're going to die. And Peter saw Jesus crucified. Peter saw it. And Jesus left him with the choice. Jesus said, I forgive you. Do you love me? Do you love me? Do you love me? You deny me three times. Do you love me? Okay. Here's how you're going to die. Here's what I'm calling you to do for your life. Now follow me. At that moment, at that moment, Peter had to make a decision about his eternity. Every day, we are faced with making a decision about our eternity. And not only that, it affects others. Persevere. Persevere. 
have self-control, have virtue, have knowledge, be diligent, be, have godliness in your life, brotherly kindness, love. Those were the things that Peter had in himself which he was able to hold on to and willfully go to the cross to. He died the same death Jesus died. But this is what helped him to follow Jesus. And Peter says, I'm coming to the end of my life and I want to remind you I want to remind you. So if you're not willing to die to self, if you're not willing to say, everything I have belongs to the Lord, my time, everything, if you're not willing to take heaven by violence, who do you really belong to? Who do you really belong to? This is a reminder from Peter to be ever faithful to the one who's always been faithful. You know why God is always on time? Because he cares about you. He knows that if he doesn't show up, you could be lost forever. If he doesn't show up and save the day, no one else will. And should we be like our Father in heaven? Absolutely. Absolutely. We should be just like our Father in heaven. This is a reminder from Peter. 